Hey everyone, Mike here. It's been a big couple weeks for commercial space. It was only a few weeks ago that I was worried about delays with the Starlink laser links. Well, SpaceX has confirmed that the satellites they just launched last week are equipped with fully working space lasers. Less than 24 hours later, OneWeb launched another batch of satellites for their constellation. And wrapping up the week, we had the Inspiration4 mission for the first all-citizen orbital mission ever. I'll do some more videos on OneWeb and Inspiration4 another time, but today I want to talk about why space lasers change everything for Starlink. <laughs> The Starlink launch on the evening of the 13th had 51 Starlink satellites destined for polar orbit. This is actually the first launch for shell number 3 of the constellation. Shell 3 has a much higher inclination over the poles to provide internet service for the far north and the far south. Shell 1 was the first all those satellites have now been launched. Those are the ones we're using now for Starlink. Shell 2 is another one similar inclination to the first, but Shell 2 hasn't actually been launched yet. SpaceX skipped over it for now and moved right to the polar orbits in Shell 3. I'm curious about the 51 satellites. Most other full Starlink launches have had 60 satellites. The ones that didn't were the ones with some kind of rideshare satellites on board as well. I couldn't find any mention of a rideshare on this launch uh, or explanation for why they're 51. So maybe these ones with laser links are a bit bigger. The actual deployment of the satellites wasn't televised for this launch since it took place over an area with no ground station coverage. So going all conspiracy theory, they could have had some other satellites on board that they didn't want to mention during the launch, but who knows. Let's take a look at some of the highlights from the launch and uh, you can judge for yourself if you think there are any secret satellites in there. Let's take a look. The Starlink satellites launching today represent a huge leap forward as the team continues to iterate and improve Starlink technology. Most satellites don't speak to each other directly. Instead, they use radio frequency communications with a ground station to relay communications between satellites. The Starlink satellites launching today will be testing fully operational optical inner satellite links, otherwise known as space lasers, to provide direct communications between the satellites without a ground station acting as an intermediary. Now, I actually paused it here and, and counted the satellites. On the left, I count 26, and on the right, I count 24. That's 50 total, so maybe there's one more up on top somewhere. I don't see any secret ones. Let's keep going. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, lift off. Max Q. Miko. <laughs> you can see the light Thanks from the engine. <laughs> <laughs> the light from that first stage engine cut off. And recognition confirmed. From main engine cut off, you saw the successful stage separation and the second stage engine has started up from those live views on your right there. That Air is and separation confirmed. the Merlin vacuum engine. And here we are waiting for fairing separation. <laughs> you can see that great view of the two fairing halves separating from the Starlink satellites. Stage one entry burn startup. What a cool view on your left of the stage one entry burn startup there. This is a 20 second burn of three of the Merlin 1D engines of the first stage. Started. 
that is our drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, in the Pacific Ocean. Beautiful view of stage one. Having landed on our drone ship for the 10th time, this marks our 90th overall successful recovery of a Falcon 9 first stage and the 124th successful launch of a Falcon 9. We just. I still love seeing those landings, even if it's dark and foggy with signal dropouts. Okay. Before I go more into the space lasers, I'd love if you could give me some feedback on the launch highlights we just saw. I love watching all the SpaceX launches, but I don't always have time to watch the whole thing. So I thought maybe you would like to watch the highlights with me and then kind of geek out on the technology a bit. So let me know what you think down in the comments. Click the like button while you're there. It really helps the channel grow. So. These fully functioning space lasers unlock a few huge new capabilities for Starlink. The first is why these satellites are going into a polar orbit. They're going to provide Starlink coverage to the north and south pole areas, beyond 53 degrees latitude. Now that's a big area, and there isn't nearly as much fiber infrastructure there. And that's exactly why Starlink is so important to anyone living or working there. There are not a lot of great internet options for consumers. But that means there's also not many good places to put ground stations. Places with good connectivity that can actually be reached and serviced. The space lasers work around that by carrying signals in space, from your user terminal to the satellite that's over your head, then through multiple hops to other Starlink satellites in space, until it can actually reach a good ground station to get onto the public internet and onto whatever you're trying to do online. The same capability will be enabled by the lasers for all the other areas on the Earth without ground stations, like oceans for boats and cruise ships and international flights. All of those are potentially unlocked by being able to route traffic around in space between the satellites. There's a great Twitter thread with Scott Manley and Elon Musk talking about the use case of using Starlink to bring connectivity to countries with repressive governments where the geopolitics aren't great for ground stations. This was specifically providing internet to people in Afghanistan, which I think would be amazing. Another potentially massive disruption, which Elon mentions at the end of the thread, is that the speed of light is not a constant. I know, I know what you're thinking, Mike, the speed of light is a constant. It's the little c in E equals mc squared, but it's the speed of light in a vacuum that's constant. When light is shooting around the world in fiber optic cables, that's traveling through glass, not a vacuum. And light traveling through glass is around 30 to 40% slower. Now it's still really fast, but by bouncing a signal up into space at Starlink's 550 kilometers orbit, and then sending the signal over the laser links and then back down to Earth, you can shave some milliseconds off the fastest routes that exist today. Now, if you're into high frequency trading, a few milliseconds advantage over everyone else, say between London and New York or Hong Kong, can mean millions and billions of extra dollars. My guess is these high frequency trading companies have probably been chomping at the bit with SpaceX to secure exclusive deals to access these lower latency routes. This low latency also means that in many cases, it will be faster to route traffic in space first before coming back down to Earth to access the public internet. This really ties in with Elon Musk's early vision for Starlink of rebuilding the internet in space. If you're trying to reach, say, Google, Starlink can route your requests in space, then come down to Earth to a ground station, maybe even on top of a Google data center. It doesn't need to use the public internet at all. This also means that ground stations will be less of a limiting factor. If your closest ground station is really busy, some signals can be routed over the lasers to come down somewhere else, spreading out the load. 
I think we'll even see cases with content services like Netflix or YouTube, where the satellites themselves might store content, like a space-based CDN, to avoid using ground links at all. We'll see. And the final huge disruption is not down here, but up there. This tweet from Elon Musk to Everyday Astronaut talks about internet access for Dragon spacecraft from the Inspiration4 mission. Elon Musk's reply is basically a resounding yes. They have the option of either using parabolic dishes in the Ka band from Starlink satellites, or the space lasers to provide a direct link from any Starlink satellite to the Dragon spacecraft. And the reason I consider this such a huge disruption is that Starlink could provide the same service to any spacecraft. So instead of every single space company having to use ground stations and all over the world to communicate with their satellites or rockets, they could just book time on Starlink and have a high bandwidth, low latency connection back down to Earth no matter what part of the world they were flying over. This has the potential to dramatically simplify spacecraft operations, making SpaceX really a full-service, triple-threat commercial space company, with spacecraft launch services, human launch services, and now orbital communication services. Plus, of course, Earth-based communication services like we're all looking for in Starlink. So maybe quadruple threat, I don't know. If you can't tell, I am crazy excited by this advance and very happy that I worried unnecessarily about Starlink launch delays. I can't wait to see how these new satellites perform in orbit. Subscribe to the channel and click that bell to get all my updates as soon as they come out. Thank you very much for watching today. See you next time.